It's a historic night in the Minneapolis Cedar Riverside neighborhood. The community marking the start of Ramadan with the first publicly broadcast call to prayer. Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry granted permission to broadcast the call to prayer five times a day during the month-long holiday. Mosques are temporarily closed due to the coronavirus and worshipers are being asked to stay home. Muslim leaders say it is a signal that no one is ever alone. I think it's another way where our city and our state continues to lead by showing how religious inclusion is possible. And so uh, it's a really a testament of our city, our mayor, and, and, and the continuous effort to make sure we're all included, we're all part of this. And in this COVID-19, as we are all staying at home, uh, that we're all in this together. They also broadcast on Facebook Live. The Cedar Riverside neighborhood is home to one of the largest populations of Muslims in Minnesota. Well, the House passed. Um, well, when he was very little, he was very rambunctious. He started talking and walking early. Like, he was walking by like six months and saying full sentences by a year. And he, he called himself a pacifist. He explained it to me as that he doesn't want to like harm people or or things. And so I had to look it up and then I went I went back to him. I said, but how does that work like if they're harming you or if you like feel really strongly about something? After they found out that Jake was Muslim, they you know call him a terror. 9-11 was awful because he get called a terrorist, asked if he was whatever group was in the news at that time, whether it was the Taliban or ISIS or whatever. And this kid, while the bus is in motion, comes and starts beating up Jake. Um, at some point, I guess he passed out from what other people have, have told me, other kids have told, told me. He had contusions all over his body, like his chest, his face, a couple on his back. He had hair pulled out of his head. I texted him. I tell him that dinner is ready. He didn't answer. When I go out there, I find him hanging. People think that bullying just affects the one being bullied, but it affects everybody. The Taylor Falls mother is mourning the loss of her teenage son. She says he killed himself after kids bullied him over and over at his school. The fact that my family has to live the rest of their life without him. And we were such an integrate family, like we were so close. It felt really good because the first person that came out was Jelani from Care, Minnesota. And it felt good to tell somebody everything that we had went through was for physically forced into a locker and not have to be afraid of what their reaction was going to be or if they were going to believe us we are going to be filing a lawsuit to hold the school district accountable for its actions that directly led to his suicide here has done so much to um, confront the issue of bullying in our schools Unfortunately, more than 60% of children have reported that they have been bullied in schools um, be, either because of their status as a Muslim or perceived status as a Muslim. And I think those numbers are probably higher than that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Jailani Hussain. I hope you're doing well. Coronavirus is impacting all of us. And I want to remind you a few things that you should take into consideration. Number one, stay home, as it's expected for us to stay home by the governor. Second, when you're outside, stay six feet away from other individuals. Make sure you're wearing a mask and gloves. And when you come home, make sure you're washing your hands. Um, and with that, it will help us slow the spread. Uh, thank you very much. And as Ramadan is upon us, Ramadan Mubarak, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.
The Muslim holiday of Ramadan starts at the end of this week. And like other spring holidays, this year's celebrations are going to look a little bit different. A mosque in Minneapolis has been given permission to broadcast the call to prayer during the month-long holiday. And Fox 9's Hannah Flood joining us live to talk about why this is so meaningful. Hannah? Hey, Kelsey. Well, I live across the street from a church, so I'm used to hearing church bells ring every hour on the hour. I think that's a sound that a lot of us are used to, but many of us have never heard the Muslim call to prayer before. But starting at the end of this week, people in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood will be hearing it five times a day. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This is what a traditional Muslim call to prayer sounds like. Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So basically it means um, God is the great, God is the greatest. Five times a day during the month-long celebration of Ramadan, this call will be broadcast over a loudspeaker from the roof of Dar el-Hijar Mosque in Minneapolis's Muslim-majority Cedar Riverside neighborhood. So I think it's going to bring a lot of smiles from the youngest in this community to the, to the oldest. Sure. Jelani Hussein, the executive director of the Council on American-Islamic Relations Minnesota, says this call will help many in the neighborhood feel together when they can't physically be together particularly our seniors who have been isolated uh, uh, during this pandemic. And so whether you're Muslim or Jewish or Christian or you name it, uh, we want you to be able to practice your traditions and your religion uh, from a remote location. Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry announced on Tuesday the city gave a noise permit to the mosque, allowing them to broadcast that call to prayer. Every religion has traditions that play themselves out in noise in some form. And this is just yet another one. Traditions that unite people in faith while they pray apart. People are going to open their windows, anticipate the call, and really feel that tranquility and the connection. That's it. So Ramadan starts at the end of this week. It goes for about a month, and after that, those calls will stop. The first call, oof, early in the morning. It goes out before sunrise, and the last call happens after sunset. Randy, back to you. All right. New here at 10, we are just two hours now away from an expanded U.S. travel ban going into effect. And the president announced last month that immigration restrictions will be imposed on six more countries. Fox 9's Sarah Danik is live at the airport right now, and Sarah, critics do have a lot to say on this. Yeah, they do. That There's uh, really people on both sides, but we talked tonight to people that actually would have family members impacted. It's added a lot of stress to some of the communities. That travel, travel ban adds six countries to the seven that are already on the list, and it's causing those from the six countries who are trying to get visas, trying to immigrate here to the U.S. to rethink everything. We came through the diversity uh, program, what's called the lottery program. Khalid Youssef came to the U.S. 20 years ago from Sudan. There was lack, lack of opportunities for people like me. His family searching for a better life. My parents immigrated or brought us here for better opportunities, you know, seeking the American dream. Khalid is now an engineer, married with a brand new baby. But his thoughts are with family in Sudan. At least one member whose plans to come and live in the U.S. on a diversity visa are now on hold. His papers have been within the embassy for at least a year, and we're, we're just waiting for the final step, which is the interview in the, in the embassy. And that's all, all his dreams are getting shattered. The president's expanded travel ban includes diversity, or lottery visas, from Sudan and Tanzania, and immigrant visas from Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar, Nigeria, and Eritrea, and has raised concerns that the president is targeting Muslim-majority countries. We just expanded the fear. We've expanded um, really going ag against what America has been, a place that has been a beacon of hope and a place where we welcome people. Jelani Hussein's CARE Minnesota office has been working to help families worried about the ban, following the first travel ban put in place three years ago. We have people who are missing their spouses. We have fathers who are missing their children. The Department of Homeland Security has said the expanded ban is not meant to target certain regions or religions, but that the countries on the list failed to meet security criteria and could be a risk to the U.S. College just doesn't see it that way. Most of these people are just honest people that are coming here for good reasons. 
Now, there is currently legislation in the U.S. House that would essentially ban the travel ban. It is uh, expected to move to the full House floor, but is not expected to make it out of the Senate. We are live tonight at MSP. Sarah Danik, Fox 9. Our Joe Augustine tells us why civil rights attorneys are receiving more phone calls from people who want to know exactly what their rights are. In a place where most come to study, this group of attorneys came to teach. What do you do if a law enforcement officer comes up to you? What do, do you have the right? Do you have to talk to them? Do you not have to talk to them? Ellen Longfellow is an attorney with the Council on Islamic American Relations. She hosted a free legal clinic Saturday morning for anyone with questions about their civil rights. A lot of people don't know that they have the right to ask for an attorney. Longfellow says more people from the Muslim community have called for legal advice as U.S. Attorney Andy Luger has launched more investigations of terror suspects. We've been getting quite a few calls of people who have been approached by the FBI, who have never been approached by the FBI before. Now Longfellow says many of the people they work with are simply intimidated by law enforcement. Some feel they have no choice but to talk to the authorities, and this can be because of a language barrier or, as she said, sometimes just simply not understanding your basic rights. What does she think about the U.S. Attorney's Program we were talking about before your story? The pilot program, yeah. yeah. You know, CARE Minnesota has been one of the programs that has been critical of the program. They feel it's too easy for the lines between investigations and community outreach to be blurred, that line to be blurred between those two. So they have been critical of it. As you heard though earlier today, Andrew Luger tried to address that mm -hmm. when he was speaking to the people at the uh, mosque earlier today. An ongoing conversation starting right here in For Minnesota. Sure. All right, Joe, thanks. I know there is one organization that always has our back, that is a shield for our community, and that's CARE. So making sure that we uplift the work that they do, making sure that we are seen and heard in the halls of Congress. Assalamu alaikum everyone, Sister Linda Sarsour here, Executive Director of Empower Change and one of the co-founders of the Women's March. I led the largest single day protest in US history. As someone who every single day is at the forefront, fighting for the rights of our community, ensuring that we are treated with dignity and respect and that we have a seat at the table, I have received the wrath of Islamophobes, right-wing Zionists, white nationalists, and every time I thought I could not move forward, that I could not take it any longer. I would turn around and find the Council on American Islamic Relations Care right behind me. They always had my back, never failed. Every time they came out in my defense, like they continue to defend the rights of all those in our communities. Sisters and brothers, we did not see this pandemic coming. Care did not see this pandemic coming. We have to ensure that our organizations, the bravest, the boldest, those who continue to do the work, even when it's hard, have the support and resources to keep building on their vision and continuing the work for many, many years to come. We cannot allow our organizations to fail right now. CARE is counting on you. They have continued to put out information on COVID-19 resources, on stimulus payments. They have uh, shared information on uh, advocacy for rent moratoriums and voting by mail. They continue to take on cases uh, from our community. Their staff across the country are working around the clock. I know that they continue to do the work and I know that you know that too. So please, sisters and brothers, please, please, please support the work of CARE. Give them your sadaqah. Give them your donation. Give them whatever you can, whatever you are blessed with. Share it with the people that care. Sisters and brothers, let's not forget. Dirul Iman provides a peaceful space for Muslims in St. Paul. Allah. Last weekend was anything but. The community is kind of on edge. They're, they're kind of surprised that something like this would happen. Someone would come in the middle of the night and, and ravish the mosque and then leave behind this graffiti of hate. Two witnesses reported confronting a man here early Saturday morning before he said, quote, good luck and walked out. They found damage to their office and taunting messages saying Merry Xmas and save your soul. This is not new. Jelani Hussein of the Council and on American Islamic Relations in Minnesota says 13 major incidents have been reported in the past six months with an additional 75 to 80 cases. This is unprecedented level. We've never had this amount of increase in such a short time. Um, and so this is extremely concerning. Last month, surveillance video caught a man smashing the glass door at a Northeast Minneapolis mosque. 
Communities from St. Cloud to Maplewood have experienced the same in recent years, with the most serious a bombing at the Dar al Farouk Mosque in Bloomington in the summer of 2017. The reality is it impacts all of us. If it impacts my community, it's impacting your community as well. Hussein points out that anti-Muslim rhetoric today is similar to anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, and other religious bigotry throughout America's history. So one of the things we have to realize is we cannot let history repeat, and we have to recognize that in this country, um, we have to speak to each other. And that means hard conversations about incidents like this one in St. Paul. And we need to tell the stories of how America is based on this identity of people coming from all over the world, different religions, and living together. And I think that is the future forward. St. Paul Police investigating this latest case as a bias-motivated crime. They've also increased patrols at mosques all across the city. A Muslim woman says she was subjected to humiliation and discrimination after spending the night in the Ramsey County Jail back in 2013. She filed a lawsuit against the county back in 2016. And today a settlement was announced that changes the policy in Ramsey County. Ellen Gallus joins us now to explain. Well, that's right. Ada al -Kady said today that she doesn't want any other woman to go through what she did. She says it tested her faith and was one of the most humiliating experiences of her life. She also says her legal fight was about much more than just this one case and it's resulting in some major changes at the Ramsey County Jail. Now, al Katie turned herself in for traffic warrant violations back in 2013. She says while she was processed at the Ramsey County Jail, she was forced to remove her hijab for a booking photo and undress in front of female officers, which goes against her religious beliefs as a devout Muslim. She also says she was later given a bed sheet to replace her hijab, and she found her mug shot posted on a public website. al Qaeda sued Ramsey County for religious discrimination, and on Tuesday, it was announced the settlement not only includes a financial payout, but a major policy change. After that experience, even though I was afraid, I wanted to pursue my rights under the Constitution of the United States. And I wanted to do that in a way that would make it less likely that any other Muslim woman would experience the humiliation and harm that I did. Now, the settlement it includes a $120,000 payment to al Qaeda, and the county is destroying all copies of that original mugshot without her wearing her head covering. Also, inmates will now be allowed to wear religious head coverings during booking photos, and employees will be trained on religious accommodations for inmates. Now, the legal group representing al Qaeda says Hennepin County was one of the first jurisdictions to willingly adopt a similar policy, and that this policy is already becoming a model around the, com uh, around the country right now. She said she wanted to see change come from this. We are starting to see that. And here it is. Yep. Okay. Ellen, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I'm Altaf Hussein and I currently serve as the Vice President for the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. You know, for the last couple of decades, several of us have been trying to serve our youth in the best way we can. Over the years, care chapters have worked with us to deliver high quality training programs. These training programs are not only focused on leadership skills, but also about imparting in our youth an appreciation for the very rich or legacy of activism within the community. In addition, your local uh, care legal team has been very active, especially in the last decade, on issues of bullying. This is something very critical and very close to all of us. Our children sometimes, according to the research, are being bullied at twice, at double the rates of most other children. So your care local team works with the students and their families, not only on reporting the incidents, but also on developing uh, publications, leading publications that are ultimately used by academics and elected officials. Throughout these years, all these decades, care has been there for us. 